before we do that, I mean, we're going to have uh, Christopher Michael John, who's been studying or dealing with uh, distributed systems, programming languages, and uh, yeah. like seems like a nice choice for that, right? Yeah. So, Michael John. Wow. Oops, I think I should have warned you. What? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we're ready to go. Shortest opening remarks. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so uh, I'm Christopher Mickeljohn. Uh, I'm going to talk about distributed Erlang related things today. Uh, I've been doing distributed Erlang stuff for a while, so if you're a returning card carrying member of the Erlang workshop, uh, I previously worked at Basho and Machine Zone, so I've been doing distributed Erlang since 2012. Or something. So um, this is the result of research that basically started um, at Basho in 2012. And uh, at least towards the end of the talk, we'll talk about a bunch of stuff that was heavily inspired by stuff that John showed me back in 2012 in a talk I watched of yours in 2010. Uh, all right, so we'll get right into it. Um, and it would help if I plug this thing in. OK, so what? What's the motivation here? What are we doing? So distributed programming is really hard. Uh, everybody in this room, if you're an Erlang programmer, you probably have it the easiest out of people who are doing it uh, in industry, because uh, you don't have to deal with serialization and message sending and connections and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but kind of the reason it's difficult is because we have to think about state management. So roughly, how do we control concurrent <coughs> access to state when we have pervasive concurrency in a system? Um, all of this is kind of you know, inherent in the problem of, of distributed computing. And then when we put things on different machines and we run them at the same time, we have to deal with the challenges of parallelism and kind of how things interplay. Do we need to coordinate? Do we not need to coordinate? What can we do to get around coordinating? And things like this. And so basically, it's kind of been well established that distributed actors are super good for this. Um, we use state encapsulation by having actors control access to the state that they, they hold. Uh, they do that usually with serial access to that state, with some exceptions. Um, the system is kind of pervasively concurrent, right? There's thousands of actors, tens of thousands of actors, millions of actors working together, uh, sometimes coordinating, sometimes not, asynchronous, synchronous, who knows? And then this kind of core property here is this asynchronous message passing with no shared memory, right? So, this maps very well to distributed computing where we don't have guarantees on message ordering, we don't have guarantees on message delivery, and finally, we don't really get to share memory unless we wrap it in some state machine and put Paxos in front of it or something like that. And so, actors are good, distributed actors are really good, they really simplify this, and there's tons of demonstrated success, right? So, uh, at least in the Erlang space, uh, in terms of Erlang has many successes, but ones that have really used distributed Erlang, we've seen League of Legends running on top of the React database for all of the kind of chat system management. Uh, we've seen systems like Call of Duty, which run communications through this. There's countless other examples. Um, and then kind of to draw, uh, to draw a comparison to some of the more modern, uh, more I guess the more recent research innovations in distributed actors, we have systems like Orleans uh, from Microsoft, uh, which I also have worked on, um, which has uh, been used as the underlying infrastructure for Halo, so the Halo game, and Gears of War, and, and some others. So, uh, modern actor systems, really great, um, but they're still limited in terms of scalability, in terms of latency, and in terms of failure handling. And so what we're going to kind of do today is briefly walk through these three issues and talk about work that's been going on uh, as part of my work with Heather and previous work at Basho for at least probably three or so years. And then I'll talk about where we're going now. So in terms of scalability, uh, most of these systems, uh, Aka Cluster, for instance, uh, Microsoft's Orleans, and Distributed Erlang all use a full mesh overlay. And so what this means is that in the worst case, it's assumed that all nodes can communicate with all other nodes in the system. Now to do this, nodes need to periodically heartbeat the other nodes to know whether an actor is still running on those nodes or not. And typically this is done by having a periodic heartbeat and then after so many misses of messages, for instance, uh, this is the net tick time settings in distributed Erlang, we'll consider a node as failed, right? So the failure detector is inherently kind of uh, um, not correct, right? It's a, it's a eventual, eventually perfect failure detector. Um, 
Now, when, in terms of messaging, since everybody connects to everybody else, we assume that we have point-to-point -point messaging between any two nodes in the network via a single hop. So I can send a message directly, and I'm guaranteed that it doesn't go through any nodes. It will go immediately to that node. So this is used by most of the industrial systems today. And um, because of this heart beating and because of other problems with global uh, coordination involved in making this membership work, uh, we've seen, you know, at least Ericsson has reported that the largest cluster they ran, at least as of two years ago when I was in Stockholm, is at 200 nodes. Um, that number may be obsolete by now. And then finally, Briac has been documented to completely collapse from congestion at 60 nodes because of the communication patterns inherent in the database. So kind of what's the idea here? So all to all heart beating, this is expensive, this is prohibitive, there's a bunch of systems. If we see console and swim from uh, the HashiCorp guys, that, you know, that their entire swim protocol is based on this problem of, of this all to all failure detection. And then finally, if we have to store data structures that say, I know about everybody else in the cluster and they, I know who they know about and I'm building this up, uh, this has been documented in previous papers at this very workshop that this causes the data structures inside of the VM to grow quadratically in memory. So if we took at latency, uh, in terms of latency, again, with full mesh, we're assuming point-to-point -point messaging with a single hop. Um, and this means that uh, given distributed neural length design where we use a single TCP connection, we're putting both control messages for cluster, member, uh, for cluster management, such as failure detection, and uh, background gossip or global coordination messages, we're putting control messages on the same channel as our data messages. So data messages might be HTTP requests that are trying to get data from a database or things like this, right? So we're mixing control and data, and these things have two different inherent workloads, they have different properties, they have different sizes. And so one of these is that uh, using a single TCP connection causes problems related to the workload. So one is that uh, you can see congestion uh, congestion happens when I have large objects and small objects sharing the same communications channel because large objects can cause slow objects to be arbitrarily delayed. Uh, they cause serialization problems, especially in systems that have runtime reflection like uh, Microsoft Orleans, because it's an object system. And then finally, contention, uh, because I may have fast senders and slow senders. So if I have some actors that are sending messages occasionally, they may be arbitrarily delayed behind actors that are sending a lot of messages. And finally, again, it's deployment dependent as well. So in deployment dependency, we might say, well, in the data center, I'm gonna assume uniform latency, maybe I have homogeneous deployments over containers running through Kubernetes. Uh, we can kind of assume a particular latency profile that's normally pretty uniform, uh, where in the geo-distributed setting, where we want to go, uh, we have non-uniform latency, because some nodes might be located like, you know, between Virginia and California, and then I might have a node that's like Virginia and Boston, right? And so, those two systems are going to receive messages in a very different mechanism than if they were co-located in the same rack or the rack right next to one another or whatever. And so finally, we see these large disparities in the latencies, right? And so uh, at least talking to some uh, production users of, of React and distributed Erlang, some of their nodes are connected as far as 60 milliseconds away. So this is a reality. We have to deal with 60 millisecond round trip times. People run in distal over it, right? Nobody's really thinking about this problem. So again, single TCP connection, what does it boil down to? Head of line blocking. So the final point is we have to deal with the reality of failures. So failures are going to happen. What types of failures are we talking about? Well, we have message omission. This happens in Erlang pretty easily. We have message reordering. This can happen in Erlang under, under reconnections, where messages on older connections are delayed coming off the socket uh, related to new connections. So you can establish a new connection that can deliver some message and then you get some message off the old connection and if that's from the same client or a, a same logical client you can end up with ordering violations. Um, you can deal with nodes crashing and coming back up with no state. You can deal with bit flips. You can deal with message corruption. You can have faulty failure detectors and so on. Right? So failure is the reality and we have to deal with it because this is kind of the fundamental issue of distributed computing. Um, so I'm going to highlight three groups of work that my group has been doing, uh, my research group has been doing. The first group of work we'll talk about is uh, scalability in terms of runtime specialization of the networking overlay. So what we want to say is that you write your application and then at runtime you say, I want to use topology X. Topology X is special for my application and you do not have to rewrite your program. 
So none of the communication pathways or anything are exposed in the programming uh, model itself. Um, this core property, you know, this is only achievable if we can provide an API where we don't uh, have to have the programmer change it if they go to like a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology versus a client server, and we'll see this. The second group of work we'll talk about is around reducing latency, and so this kind of focuses around a, a couple main concepts here. One is that we want to increase the number of TCP channels that exist between the nodes, allowing us to increase parallelism. Um, we want to move maintenance traffic off to separate channels so we don't run into head-of-line blocking from background activities. And then finally, we want to leverage monotonicity to do load shedding where possible. We'll talk about where that applies as well. And finally, the last bit of work that we'll talk about is very, very new stuff. Um, it is in progress right now uh, in the labs of Carnegie Mellon University. So, uh, and we'll talk about uh, how we can do automatic failure injection for any application that's written on partisan. Uh, and most of this fault injection will come out of the box. The programmer will have to do very little, and it will be driven by grid chip. Okay? So the system we're going to present today that it talks about these solutions is called Partisan. You've probably heard of it. I've talked about it a lot on the internet, so I apologize. And so Partisan basically is a playground to demonstrate the viability of research ideas. Right? So uh, we're not trying to write a replacement for distributed Erlang. What we're trying to do is demonstrate that some ideas work out really well, some ideas we have don't work out really well. And the goal here is to kind of figure out what this is, run it on real workloads with real applications, and kind of you know, try to build a conversation back to the Erlang community to say, this is how we want to change distal, kind of what impacts does it have, and where can we go? Uh, we have a prototype implementation. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's implemented as a library in Erlang, so it's kind of in user land, not in the runtime. You don't have to build a special Erlang. It's open source. It's available on GitHub. And uh, we have a lot of open source users. Uh, a lot, I guess. I say that like it's a lot, but it's like four, which is like overwhelming when you're a PhD student and the only maintainer of the library. Uh, further making it overwhelming is that one of those users is a Fortune 500 company, so that's like really intimidating for a PhD student that works on his research all the time and has to maintain an open source library. So this is kind of a double-edged sword, right? It shows that our stuff is important and people care about it, but now I have a second job. So. So that's the reality of it. All right, so let's talk about scalability. So I talked about topologies, so what do I mean by this? So when it comes to the communication pathways that nodes may have in a cluster, they're going to be assembled into some sort of overlay network which will enforce what communication paths exist, where we open connections, and how we know who's members of the cluster. So the default topology that you're probably familiar with if you've used distributed Erlang is the full mesh topology. Again, it assumes all, uh, all nodes will eventually connect to all nodes. Um, in distributed Erlang, this is done through um, this, this heart-beating interval. In ours, we actually just uh, consider nodes fail when connections are dropped, so we maintain active connections with TCP keep alive. And uh, when connections drop, we assume the nodes failed. So we have an implementation of full mesh that's in user land. Um, it supports point-to-point -point messaging with a single hop. And what we do is when a node learns about another node in the network, when it joins initially, it will use a data structure, it uses a CRDT, it has a data structure that it will put its node information into, and then it will gossip that to all the other nodes in the system. So it will flood the network with this <coughs> data structure. Uh, this is a maintenance message, and we'll talk about the impact on performance for maintenance messages. And then all of the nodes will eventually come to agreement on this value. They can block, or they can uh, proceed immediately. So by default, this is kind of a, an eventual membership system. Again, this is similar to distributed Erlang. This is our baseline that we built in Partisan, so we had a one-to-one -one correspondence with the way the VM worked, but implemented as a library, so we could start building on top of that. So to explore a little bit more, we thought, well, what, what is another interesting pattern of communication that you might have? So one is client-server. So in client-server, we assume that the servers here will be uh, partitioned servers that are responsible for some portion of the user base, and then the users will communicate with a server that is either closest to them or a server that is randomly selected. So again, the communication pathway here is that clients always talk to servers, and servers communicate with clients, and servers are allowed to communicate with other servers. Uh, it's point-to-point -point messaging supported through the server. So if two clients wish to communicate to one another and send each other a message, they will communicate via rendezvous through the server. This happens automatically by the system. Uh, 
one other point I wanted to make here is, again, the failure detection mechanism is basically the same. And uh, each of these is tagged. So when joins are issued, so one of the questions is how do you provide an API for joins that works. And so when joins are issued, if this client says, like, I want to join this, this one will say, no, I'm a client. Here's the address of the server. Talk to the server. Or, if it, or it will join the server, and it will organize that way. So clients will refuse connections by other clients, but will refer them to servers to say, no, we connect to the server here. So that's how the communication happens there. Yeah. You mentioned uh, rendezvous, or is, was that a specific rendezvous hash there? Uh, no, so uh, yeah, I okay. use the word rendezvous very oh, loosely, okay. as in uh, the English language kind of definition. So it's a, it is not a rendezvous style. This node will talk to the server and block for a message, and then the other person will send. It's not like it's not like Tony Hoare's rendezvous. It's more like this node will send a message to the server saying, I want to route this to this client. Can you route it for me? Uh, yeah, can you assist in routing this to the destination? Okay, so the, 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 the topology that Partisan is probably most famous for is an implementation of the Hypar View protocol. This stands for the Hybrid Partial View Protocol. Uh, that's made by colleagues of ours in, in Lisbon. Um, and so this, this topology is built for the assumption that you want to support 10,000 nodes. Um, our implementation currently gets to around 1,500 to 2,000 nodes, so it's a very impressive number. Um, and the way this protocol works is that a particular node in the network will know, will contain two membership views. It will contain an active view, which is represented by these darker blue links, and then it will contain a passive view, which is represented by the lighter blue links. So when a node joins the cluster, it will be put into one of these views based on an algorithm that we don't have time to discuss here, but it's documented. And then when connections drop, so what this will do is it will migrate things from the active view to the passive view until the graph is with probabilistic guarantee that it will converge to a fully connected component. And if it's not, then you can issue a protocol to churn it, and it will try to reach a fully connected component. Now, if this link happens to go down here, we run into a situation where this graph may not be fully connected, depending on whether these links stand. And so what we'll do is, under failure, we will use members that are in the passive view as candidates for active replacement. So we will select a candidate for passive. We will say, can you issue the join? We'll try to join it into the cluster. We'll turn this thing. By joining a new node, we'll evict other nodes from active back into passive. And then this process will churn until this membership disseminates all the way down. And so this replacement is kind of a complicated algorithm on how it happens. But the general in intuition here is that under this is completely probabilistic. But if nodes in our implementation, if nodes don't get connected, they will reissue another join, which will cause the network to churn again in one iteration, and then eventually you'll reach a fully connected component. Now, um, one thing to note here that I'm going to just highlight, because I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on, is that some of these links can be selected to form a tree where I have no redundant paths. But in this case, there are redundant paths that are identified here. Okay? So when I um, so the way I do failure detection is that when any of these connections drop, I will consider that node is failed, and I will evict that node from the active view, which will cause a passive view candidate to be promoted into the active view. Now, one of the things that uh, we do for an optimization is we keep TCP connections open to passive view members, because when it comes time to perform the passive replacement into active, I might select a member in the passive view that is failed, because that member may have been evicted into the passive view. And so what I have to do is I want to know candidates in the passive view that are active so I can do the replacement as fast as possible. So I maintain connections to some members of the passive view. Um, and that number can be configured based on, uh, based on performance and how much memory you want to keep open and things like this. Okay. Now this net, uh, sorry, in point-to-point -point messaging, so uh, the final point to highlight here is that if this client wants to talk to this client and wants to send a message, it might not be directly connected. And so what we need the system to do is we need to have a mechanism to ensure that I can get a message to somebody else that I might not be able to talk to directly. Okay, so now, assuming that we have that, uh, assuming that we have that HyperView overlay, uh, we may run into situations where not all of the links in the overlay have equal cost. And so we see here that some of these links have cost based a cost 10 and a cost 2 and a cost 1. Now these cost metrics can be derived anyway. By default, we could assume this is round trip time based on pinging that's going on in the background. So if we assume that these are some cost metric derived by network distance, 
then we may want to optimize this graph because if I can perform a series of steps of optimizations, I can optimize the graph so I can send a message from one side of the graph to the other side of the graph much quicker if I optimize it correctly. And so what the XBOT protocol does is it performs a four-step optimization pass for replacements of nodes. And what this will do is it will try to randomly select, it will try to optimize by selecting a candidate that has a lower view, and then it will perform this four-phase four phase pass, which is required because you could have failures between, where it will say, hey, I want to, I'm considering using you for a candidate, can you report this information back to me? Yes. Okay, let's now try to do this optimization. And so the optimization roughly looks like two-phase commit. And so this allows us to optimize overlays to reduce the cost of overall message dissemination. And so this is work that's been implemented by, um, by a master's student that we've been working with. And uh, right now we're in the evaluation stage where we're trying to run this on Google Cloud Platform to see, to see how big we can get clusters and how efficient we can make them. So I said before, what happens if I want to have a node here send a message to a node here, or a node here send a message to you know, some other node over here that's only connected through here? And so if I want to provide a uniform API for messaging that works for full connectivity and also works for partial connectivity, I need to have a mechanism for forwarding messages around. And so um, what will happen is the system will basically pulse through uh, empty payload messages that contain only a logical clock will be pulsed through the network to cause a tree to emerge. So this will basically compute a tree out of this graph. And once the spanning tree is basically computed, I can forward messages up and down the links based on this tree that is disseminated, and then I can get a message from one destination to another destination I may not be connected to. Now this is only probabilistic because the tree can be changing because nodes could be failing while the system is executing. So again, we have a probabilistic overlay, we have a tree that will be stabilized at some point in time, but it's undetermined how long that tree will be stabilized. It could change over time. And our forwarding is only best case because if the tree happens to change during dissemination, I may send a message, I may forget one of the links, or I may not see one of the links because the tree is churning. So again, this is still probabilistic, but that's okay, because Erlang doesn't make any of these guarantees either. <laughs> but, <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a moment. So one other thing that we could do is now, once we've introduced an overlay like this and we start sending messages, we might run into situations where messages are delivered in really bad out of order. Like they could be massively out of order. And this is because if the tree is churning, I could deliver one message on, path one, but then when I try to send message two, it might have to go on path one, two, five, six, right? So it might take longer for that message to be delivered. And so you might want to enforce ordering on messages. So again, Erlang does best effort on this. It's hard to build infrastructure on best effort systems. And so uh, we have a mechanism that is fairly expensive to use that can provide causal ordering as opt-in per channel per sender. And this is, again, important where we don't have this uh, delivery guarantee. So if we imagine a situation where actor, has three actors on three different nodes, and I send message A to node C, I might have the expectation that if A sends a message B to actor two, and then B, uh, actor two sends a message C to actor three, I may have the assumption that these messages should be delivered in order, right? I mean, B is causally influenced by A, so I don't want to deliver the effect of C until I've delivered A, because both messages have a dependency on A if I perform the causal cut analysis here. So I may want this guarantee. You say, my, why may you want this guarantee? Well, if you've attended any of the work on uh, Pony, you know, Scott's been doing some work on that. I, know, I think there's been Pony talks previously here. Distributed Pony's garbage collector requires this exact algorithm. It requires this exact solution to work in the distributed context. So when we start thinking about how we can perform things like type safety and capabilities management and things like this, you need something like this for at least some of your channels because the garbage collection mechanism requires this. I actually had a conversation with Sophia where she drew out her thing. She was like, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. And I drew out this graph. I'm like, this is the problem I'm solving. And she's like, oh, my, that's the same problem. Um, unfortunately, this algorithm is, uh, we're trying to solve it a bit more efficiently. This algorithm that we've implemented to prototype the feature is fairly expensive. It's the Andre Schiffer algorithm from 89, so it's order n squared on metadata storage. So it is fairly expensive, but um, we're working on trying to optimize this 
through the use of spanning trees as well, since we already have the tree. So the problem is, is that if I need causality, and I also have this transitive delivery, and I need guarantees that messages will be delivered, I still need to layer reliable communication on top of this. And so what we need to do is we need to buffer messages. We need to retransmit them if we don't receive acknowledgments. Um, in the causal ordering case, if I omit one message, the system will not be able to make progress anymore. The system will never deliver another message because it will say, well, everything depends on that one thing a long time ago that I never got. So I will just not let you see anything. So systems like this are really important when you want to start providing ordering guarantees. Uh, and so we have a mechanism that's built in for this. You can say per message, I'd like an acknowledgement. Messages will basically be buffered. If they're dropped, it will retransmit the messages and it will ensure that messages are delivered in order. And so in this case, uh, are delivered reliably. So in this case, message one was dropped because of a network failure and basically message one was retransmitted until an explicit acknowledgement was received back at the sender. And so this combines with that transitive delivery thing because the acknowledgements will be forwarded back through that tree. All right, so that's basically all the work that we have on scalability. So we have one experiment. So what we wanted to do is say, what are the trade-offs of having these different topologies? And so we took a distributed key value store that, uh, that's called LASP. It's appeared at this workshop before. But basically, it's a peer-to-peer -peer key value store for CRTs. And what we wanted to examine was what happens if I run the same ex I run the exact same workload, the same number of messages, the same payload size, but all I did was change the network communication paths on the network. And so again, client server basically says there's a server node that serves as routing all messages between the clients, and peer to peer says I can route my messages through anybody to anybody else. And so this experiment, what we see is this black line represents the client server bandwidth required to transmit this experiment using log scale. Um, and this is the peer-to-peer -peer one. So what we see, the first thing that we can look at here is that client server stops performing at 512 nodes. That's why there's no line for it. And the reason for this is because the server becomes such a contention point that clients are fighting for it that even disseminating membership information to keep the cluster running is starting to slow down. And we see the server becomes a bottleneck. Now, we could do this by adding more servers, but this experiment is done with one server to show the traditional client server, right? You'd only be buying time by parallelizing your servers, right? Now, the second experiment that we see here is that, well, client server is going to transmit less data than peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, the reason this happens is because client server has no redundancy in it. A message is sent once, it goes over one path to the destination. That's it. Now, in the peer-to-peer -peer simulation for 32 and 64, there's redundancy built into the overlay because the overlay has these redundant connections for repair. So when I send a message on the network, it may take multiple paths. For instance, if I'm gossiping or sending a data structure, it may take multiple paths so that communication on the network is doubled or some, and, you know, it goes up here. Uh, so in some cases, it's doubled. Sometimes it's other factors. And so we see that the peer-to-peer -peer basically uh, while it scales better, because of the redundancy, you pay more cost. And so there's an argument here to be made that if I'm running in a situation where I can have two servers and I'm running in a data center and I don't need the redundancy or the scalability, the client server strategy may be the most efficient because you'll send the least amount of data. Uh, and if you, I need to scale to a large number of nodes and be fault tolerant, I need to have uh, this redundancy built into the network and I'll pay more cost for the exact same workload. So again, this is... Same application, everything. All we did was change the communication paths in the network. And so some of these are pretty big disparities here. I mean, if you look at the log scale. So. All right, so that's kind of the first bit. So the idea here is that we can provide applications. We can have it so runtime, you say the topology you want, and you don't have to change any of your application code, and you get different scaling characteristics. So the second bit of work that we're going to talk about is how I reduce latency in the network. Um, and this is based on varying workloads. It's based on the assumptions that distributed Erlang has kind of in the box. So the first optimization we're going to talk about is affinitized parallelization. And so the problem here is that if I only have a single TCP connection between any two nodes on the network, I'm going to have head of line blocking problems. I'm going to ultimately have actors waiting to send messages because other actors are occupying the socket, or I'm serializing an object, or there's network congestion, or whatever. So the first thing that we do is we enable multiple TCP connections between nodes in the network. Uh, so this allows us to have increased parallelism. 
But what we'll see is that if you randomly schedule communications on these network paths, you don't necessarily get better performance. Because you may just start sending messages randomly, you actually start paying scheduler costs by context switching between different processes. So if I send message one, I have to activate that process and send on that socket, and then I have to send message two, I randomly activate another one. You're actually paying quite a bit in context switching, where if I just stayed on one socket, uh, that then I would have better performance. So there's really a trade-off here based on latency, how many connections you have, and what your workload is. So basically, to affinitize the traffic, what we do is we try to do automatic placement. Um, we try to infer things using the process dictionary, depending on the application. We try to infer what the application patterns are. For something like React, this is very easy because it has vnode identifiers that easily map to communication pathways. Um, it's, it can be really difficult for other applications. So we're looking at, um, I'm currently working on ver verifying, uh, importing a um, a Byzantine fault tolerant messaging protocol that's used in, in a blockchain application. And so this is like a little bit more difficult. Like, well, how do I parallelize this? Because everything's going to be ordered and like people are updating objects based on particular orders. So this is a bit more difficult. Um, but this is really optimal if I have high latency or big packet sizes because I can parallelize the work. I basically can leverage the additional parallelism. And an interesting thing to think here is that if I have 100 actors on this node and 100 actors on this node, and they're all running concurrently, and I have multiple schedulers, so some of those are running in parallel, and then I send through one TCP connection, I'm kind of reducing the parallelism quite a bit, right? So I really should have multiple TCP communication channels to allow things to act in, in parallel. And so kind of to give you the intuition here is that you know if we have a bunch of objects, we can say that process two and process three have affinity to one connection, where process one has affinity to a different connection. And we'll see examples of where that's really valuable. The second optimization is um, classifying these channels differently by names. So we have the ability to also, uh, in addition to having multiple connections, we'll name these connections. Um, this, again, is good for those cases with small senders, fast senders, or background traffic, and data traffic. Um, and the idea here is that if I have a system that uses gossip, for instance, something like Cassandra or React, this is periodic cluster maintenance data that doesn't need to be on the main communications channel because it has nothing to do with servicing requests a lot of the time when it's just maintenance. So this could be cluster metadata, it could be background information, it could be failure detection, and things like this. And so what we can do is we can say, well, no, I want my request traffic to go on this channel, and I want that channel to be parallel, and I want my background channel, my background traffic like gossip or metadata management, I want that to go on another channel. And so this allows me to separate out different communication types that may have different shapes to their workload. And finally, the last optimization is around leveraging monotonicity. So monotonicity in this case is, um, to give you an example, the React ring data structure grows monotonically. So it's always growing. Now it's not always growing in size, it's always growing in logical time. So it has a timestamp. And I know that any object that has timestamp one is going to be greater than timestamp two. And so these objects can be, get very big. A ring could get to be over a meg, it could be two megs, depending on what things you stuff in there. Bachelor people used to love to stuff stuff in the ring, which is really bad, but it's very convenient for getting it to every node on the network. And so, and so the idea here is that if we know the shape that the data is taking, we can perform load shedding based on that. So if we are sending a bunch of rings, and these rings are waiting to be sent because the network is occupied or I'm paying serialization costs, if I know that I have ring three already in the queue, I don't really need to send ring one and two. So I can dump those rings almost immediately, and I can take only ring three. Um, and so this is really cool because uh, we came up with the idea in the context of React, but in the context of CRDT data stores, this is really valuable too for high concurrency modifications where you're saying like, hey, I only need to send the last one, um, and things like that. So uh, we performed some evaluations, so we'll talk a little bit about what these numbers look like. Um, so here's the baseline performance. Uh, so this is a box plot where you're seeing is latency on the y-axis, you're seeing concurrent actors on the x-axis. Um, you have two bars here, um, so everybody familiar with block plots, box plots? Anybody not familiar with box plots? Not familiar, okay, so, this, uh, so these are the error bars, these are the outliers, this is going to be the first quartile, third quartile mean, okay? And so um, the interesting thing to note from this graph is that 
Uh, at least at <coughs> Erlang User Conference three years ago, uh, when I presented my initial design for Partisan, I was met with a lot of aggression from people at the conference who believe that a distributed runtime needs to be in the VM and it needs to be in C because it's closer to the metal and we wanted to prove that that was not true. And so uh, this experiment basically shows you the performance of Partisan implemented 100% in software, implemented as user space, not in the VM. And we see that we're doing pretty good. We're beating it. Lower is better. We want lower latency interactions. Lower is better. So we see as the concurrency goes up, even with only one TCP channel, we can still do better than distro out of the box. So this is partisan, one channel, none of the optimizations I talked about. This is just done in user space. So this is really nice. Um, yeah, it's really nice. I mean, these aren't huge disparities, but they, the trend continues as it goes up. Uh, so this confirms our baseline implementation. This serves as kind of a baseline for the remainder of the experiments to show you that just partisan will remain competitive with distributed neural networks. Um, right, so the next one. So what happens when we introduce parallelism? So we see here, this is a workload. So let me describe the workload quickly. I didn't do that. For the workload, what we're doing is message sends between two nodes, and we just do a fixed number of message sends. We only have a very fixed amount of concurrency in the system. We do not overload the system, so we can measure latency of an individual message appropriately. Now what you're seeing here is you're looking at uh, partisan so you have distro, you have partisan, this is the unoptimized, so none of the optimizations enabled. And what we see here is uh, partisan with the parallel optimizations enabled. Same workload, object size, one megabyte. Latency is assumed to be 0 0.5 milliseconds for a single message send, which is representative of communication within a single availability zone on Amazon, uh, assuming that you don't have like InfiniBand or something like that, okay? So what we see here is that generally partisan is doing pretty good. I mean, we're both both configurations of partisan are beating distro. But what's going on with the parallelism? So why is the parallelism like this? So the reason parallelism is like this, why is it not as good? So here it's like better. Here it's a little worse. Here it's a little worse. So why is this? So the reason is, is because under a purely random scheduling, they are paying costs of the VM of swapping in and out our TCP connections off the schedulers. This is all cost paid in scheduling overhead by acting, by picking a new socket for every single message and sending the message. So we see the parallelization optimization doesn't really buy you anything until you affinitize the parallelism. So here we see affinitized parallelism. So the only difference we've made here is that we've tried to affinitize where the TCP, uh, where the workload is going. So we see now we're beating it. Now, as soon as we say, let's be smart about how we're assigning messages to connections, we start getting more performance improvements. And we see that uh, as outlined here. Again, uh, affinitization is super important. Uh, I've been working on, I worked on uh, Orleans and distributed actors this summer at Microsoft, and our entire project there was on affinitization, so this is, this is really good. You want to be really smart about how you schedule things. Uh, because you start getting some really nice optimizations. So what we've done here is, uh, so this experiment, I'd like to have more data, but uh, running against the clock here, so uh, to, to write, uh, to get these experiments done. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the affinitized uh, partisan versus distro. This is when I'm running with 20 milliseconds latency. So yeah, this is the same experiment as before, but all I've done is increased the latency between nodes. So I said 0 0.5 before, this is 10 milliseconds for a message and we're bouncing the message back and forth here. So really, uh, you're seeing uh, this is a one-way send of 10 milliseconds. The slide is uh, incorrect. So one-way send of 10 milliseconds. And so we see the trends kind of continue, but we see partisan and distal start to pull away from each other once the latency starts increasing. And again, this is because distal is basically blocking on these connections. The connection is sending slow because of the higher latency, so every message just gets serialized behind every other message. Okay, uh, so now what happens when we increase the payload size? So again, another, another metric for what the cost uh, of, of sending messages in, in an active system is, is message size. So in Orleans, this is really bad because serialization blocks communication quite a bit because uh, it needs to use runtime reflection on C-sharp objects that are generated through code gens. So they have a lot of other nonsense in them. And so serialization takes a super long time. In distributed airline, serialization is not that big of a problem, but it is still a problem. Uh, 
because we had to implement a custom serializer, so we know this. Uh, and what we see here is that even with the larger payload, we start to pull away even more. We start to see distributed uh, Erlang start to get slower as well. All right? So those were the micro benchmarks that show the optimizations. But now the question is, is what does this actually look like in a real workload? And so this is very much work in progress. Uh, so what we've done is uh, I ported React Core to Partisan. So I have a version of React that runs with all of our optimizations, stuff like that. Uh, that's, it's a prototype implementation of React Core using Partisan. And so what you see here is I've implemented an echo service. So this is a messages will get routed to a particular node randomly. And then that node will basically, based on a key that's provided, will then route that through consistent hashing to one of the nodes. And then the response will come back. So I do a send an outside send from the client to a particular node. That node will go through the hash ring to select one other node, and it will echo a binary through, and that's it. So there is no CPU work really happening other than message serialization, and, um, and it's only talking to one node. So the communications pattern is inherently one to one. It's random, the keys are normally distributed, and then they are sent. So the key is a brand new, normally distributed, and then it goes to the hash ring, which is uniform distribution, and so this is what we're seeing for the echo service. So this is one millisecond latency, one megabyte payloads. And what we see is that, you know, distal and partisan, when you only have one concurrent worker and, and uh, one connection, we see that under the one latency, I mean, we're really close, right? We start out pretty good, but then as concurrency is increasing, you know, and these things kind of bobble back and forth, we see that we're staying pretty tight here. So we're competitive with uh, distal, but under these low latency scenarios where there's no CPU bound work and we're really just sending things to the messages, the network as fast as possible, and the object size is small, we're basically performing around the same. Now, if we increase the latency, uh, we see that partisan is doing much better in terms of throughput. So these are throughput graphs. Um, we see a partisan as the concurrency is increasing, uh, the performance of the system is increasing, and we see, you know, there's going to be a point where it bottoms out. And so basically here, what you're seeing in distal is, as that latency goes up, distal is, that's it, it's flat out. It's not going anywhere higher. It is hitting peak performance with this workload and this application at that size. Now, if I increase the message size to eight megabytes, we see the patterns starting to kind of, we're exacerbating the problem by putting more stress on the system, serializations, bigger, bigger object sizes, deserialization, scheduling. And so what we see is that partisan basically is outperforming distal here from, I forget what this is, 60 to basically up, uh, upwards 90. And so here we also see that uh, the partisan performance continues to go up in high latency and, uh, and high object sizes, where distal basically is just kind of staying at, at a normal pace. So the echo service is interesting, but unless you're living in 1987, like you're not building echo services like at UC Berkeley, so we want to run something a little bit more representative of a real workload. So I built a replicated key value store. This is Quorum Replication a la React. So a request comes into one node, it will go to three nodes on the ring, and we'll wait for responses from two. We vary the message size, we vary the latencies. Um, now this work is a bit more expensive. So this is a much more CPU-bound workload and network-bound workload. Uh, what's happening is every request fans out to three other nodes, so you're contending for resources on those nodes. There's contention um, because each of those nodes is accepting messages and acting serially. Um, another complexity is that when writes happen, I'm sending the object to three nodes, I'm waiting for two to come back, and then I'm returning that response to the user. When I issue read operations, I am waiting for two responses, and then I'm merging them, uh, merging them using last writer wins. So I have to look at all the objects. I have to pick the one with the greatest timestamp, and then I return the object back to the user. And so this workload is a bit different. And so what we see here is that, you know, again, under the, under the small object sizes with low latency, basically we're doing about the same. Sometimes distro wins, sometimes partisan wins. It's basically competitive. But as we start increasing the object size and latency, we see that partisan is pulling away. But even if we change the object size, it's still pretty tight until we get large objects at high latency. And the reason here that this looks so much different than the echo benchmark is because so much of the time is being spent in the actual code, merging these objects and waiting for the objects to come back and contending for resources between the different V nodes in React. And so we can see this by, there are certain configurations that we can have with the experiment where we see the cost is basically the same regardless of the optimizations. 
or transport layer because we're really just waiting on React all the time. And so this is a little bit different, but we see that at least the general trends hold performance increases as throughput and latency, as latency increases and object payload increases. And so kind of a little anecdotal thing here is that in React is the unspoken rule of, hey, you know, don't send objects that are bigger than one megabyte, and like, you know, in React CS will hash objects to one megabyte, so why, why all those sizes? Where do those numbers come from? Those numbers come from distro, because distro starts going real bad at one megabyte, and everybody's like, don't store objects bigger than one megabyte. And so there are a lot of design decisions that can be observed, at least in the wild, that are based on these assumptions that the runtime is just going to be really shitty under a particular workload, and so let's write software around it. And so that's kind of accidental complexity that's not really essential to the problem that we're trying to solve. All right, and so that is kind of the, the piece on optimizations before I get into testing. So the testing stuff is really, really hot off the press, new work. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to show you is stuff that doesn't completely work yet. Some of it is stuff that does completely work and is on GitHub, so you can play around with it. But we'll kind of talk through what our methodology for testing is in the remaining 10 minutes. Um, so generally speaking, what, what we're assuming here is that you have applications, and these applications are normally going to be run on nodes, and those nodes are going to be communicating via distributed Erlang. In our presentation, we propose that you will communicate between all of your nodes through the partisan uh, underlying infrastructure. And we assume this gives you the topology changes and the latency <coughs> optimizations. And so what we wanted to do was say, but man, things can still fail. Where can things go wrong? What can we do? And so the general idea uh, that we've built here is that, hey, we control the networking layer. We can do whatever we want now, right? We can control everything. And so uh, what we built was uh, heavily inspired by Kyle Kingsbury's work on Jepson and Peter Alvaro's work on, on lineage-driven fault injection. What we basically built is a fault injector that comes to partisan out of the box. And so what this fault injector will do is it will basically, uh, so one of the things that has to do is it has to turn off the optimizations in partisan because it needs to control things very precisely for the testing to work. So it disables caching, and we do a lot of caching and serialization hacks to get the performance we get. What we do is we basically turn those optimizations off, and we generate schedules of executions, and in those schedules, we put failures that we believe will cause problems in the execution of your application. So the only thing, uh, so basically, you get this infrastructure, the test harness, everything, all of this comes out of the box for free. The only thing the application user has to provide is a quick check model written in statum style of their application behavior. So for React, I had to model a key value store as a dictionary. For this Byzantine fault tolerance thing, I don't know what the hell I'm doing yet because I don't understand a lot about blockchain, but I know it will involve something around ordering messages. And basically, you plug in whatever you want here. We have one for VernMQ that's, that's under development because uh, VernMQ uses PlumTree, and we already have PlumTree running on Partisan, so it's very easy to just swap the components in and start testing. So all you have to do is provide this behavior. It says, if an operation happens, this is what the state should look like on disk, and we'll verify that. So it's specification of application invariance. And then finally, since Partisan orchestrates the running of the entire test, it's running in the distributed context automatically. Since Partisan controls the entire test execution, it can ensure that the entire execution is deterministic. And that's important because that means that when we generate counterexamples, these counterexamples can be run as part of a regression suite. So when I find bugs in React where I have a consistency violation, I can store those in a test suite, I can rerun it, and I can say, yeah, I didn't violate whatever the hell, causal plus consistency, whatever, right? So this is the design of the system that we're building. So determinism is really, really important uh, in the execution of this. So um, if you consider the case where I want to issue a request to write an object, and that's replicated, so it goes into a black box, that black box will do replication inside of it. And then I want to inject a failure. One of the problems that you have with this approach using black box testing of existing software is that I need to synchronize my failure injection with the completion of the write command. Now, this write could be delayed, right? Like, it could have returned to the user and said, yeah, I'm done. But internally, it still might be doing things, right? Like, if this is React, it could be doing anti-entropy, it could be doing handoff, it could be timed out, and it could be waiting to retry a request. So it's really difficult because you have to synchronize your failure injection with the command. So we need to have hooks for stuff like this. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. We have some of this working, some of this is not working yet. Uh, but the core part is you have to have determinism here because if you want to shrink the schedules, 
So to prove the minimal failing counter example to store in your regression suite, you need this thing to be able to be run over and over and over with the same effect. Now the second one is, what does the fault injector do? So the fault injector is really general. It is a general interposition mechanism for messages. So it says on every message sent and every message received, I can do whatever I want. So it is a completely general mechanism. What we do in reality is we have a bunch of things that you get for free. Those things you get for free are we can do message, this should be reordering, so your message reordering. We do uh, message to omission, we can drop things on the floor, we can duplicate messages. We can add ingress and egress delay, so we can say, hey, when I receive messages, delay those messages coming into the system by 300 milliseconds, but when I send, send them really fast. Those are nice failures. Uh, we have things like network partitions, super granular. You can do asymmetric partitioning, symmetric partitioning. You can do cluster partitioning, all sorts of types of fun network partitioning. And finally, we have a series of BFT failures where we can corrupt messages. You know, you can send object A, and I can replace the object on the wire with something else. I can do all sorts of fun things to break things. And then finally, the application model can expose custom faults too. So when we ran React, I exposed a custom fault that says, hey, I want to corrupt messages on disk. Hey, I want to advance the vector clock of an object. That's a fun one. What happens when I make it look like an object on disk suddenly went into the future, right? You can do all sorts of fun things. And, and this vector clock, it sounds like mad black magic, like why would that failure ever happen? But in reality, a bit flip can flip the most significant bit of a vector clock and completely advance it by 127 logical write operations. So this is a real thing that can happen, right? And so this is the overview of the system. So how do we run this thing? So Peter Alvaro said to me, like, man, but you're not being smart about it. Like, I'm all about building smart tests. I want to figure out exactly where to cut the points. So we're being a little bit dumber about it, but we're throwing as much compute as possible at it to see what this brings out, right? And so we will start a bunch of executions with random seeds. We'll put the application into a container. I'll take all those containers and I'll put it in Kubernetes, and then I'll run Kubernetes on Google Cloud Platform, and I'll say, run me as many tests as I have money for. And I run 100 containers at the same time, running 100 tests, sometimes I run 1,000 containers. I basically use all the money Google gives me to do this stuff. And I do this all through Kubernetes, it orchestrates everything. Disto, I get Disto running through Kubernetes, we get the whole thing set up. And so basically the best part about this, so the part that makes me the most happy, is I'm a grad student and I like going to the bar, and I like doing work while I'm at the bar. So what I do is I start all my tests, and then what I do is I say, hey, automatically aggregate all my counterexamples, and then it sends me a message on Slack, well it did when we were doing the initial version of this, it sent me a message on Slack saying, hey, I've got a counterexample, and then I can download that counterexample to my laptop and rerun it on my laptop. So that's really nice, right? I run a distributed test, I run them as much as possible, I generate as many failures as I can, I bring them back, I run them on my laptop, I put them on my regression suite. So this is super neat. So I only have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to briefly talk about what we did to our initial work on validating this. So we ported React for Partisan. We built a model, verify strong consistency, causal consistency, eventual consistency. Some of these are harder to verify than others, and John has experienced verifying eventual consistency. It's a very tricky one. Uh, causal is actually very interesting as well. And so finally, then what we do is we run these, and I, I implemented a toy key value store in React Core, and you know, as a bachelor engineer, I thought I was very capable of implementing a database, and apparently I implemented a database that had a lot of bugs in it, and I found all of them. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the last bit I want to talk about is a little novel piece that we're trying to build now to try to be smarter about how we shrink schedules. So the idea here is that if I have an application model, I may have an incorrect assumption, which I actually did in reality, have an incorrect assumption that all reads should return the values of the most recent writes, regardless. Now this assumption is not really true. This is not true because under a single failure, React Core is fault tolerant, right? Under like N N one failure. And so I should be tolerant to one failure. So I may generate a counterexample that looks like this. I join node two to node one, I join node three to node one, I perform a write, I perform a read, I perform a read, I create a partition on the network that isolates n1 from 2 and 3, and then I read again. This is a counterexample because I time out my read operation. Now, I want to remove commands that have no effect on the outcome here, right? So I want to be able to shrink this to say, hey, these two read operations that happen between the write and the read and the network partition, these things don't matter. And so I should be able to provide a minimal counterexample that says, hey, all I have to do is write, partition the network, and read, and I'll violate a read follows write constraint. Now we can do that, and it takes a hell of a long time to shrink, but that's why we throw so much computing resources at it. 
But what we'd like to be able to do to be a little bit smarter is say, hey, I want to inject failures in the large. I want to partition the network into two real groups, a minority and a majority, and then I want to partition the network. But when I perform shrinking, I'd like to rewrite this command into something that's more granular because I know that that really big failure that might not happen, that really big failure isn't the real cause of the problem. The real cause of the problem is somewhere else. And so what I could say here is, well, when I'm partitioning n1 from 2 and 3, What's really happening? Well, what's really happening is I have a series of asynchronous, asymmetric faults, right, that isolate node one unidirectional connections, communication with node two and three. And so what I want to do is say, well, really, this failure is only really possible if I have asymmetric, I wrote async here because it's a typo, but asymmetric partition where node two can't send its response to node one, and node three can't send its response to node one. So I actually don't need to not send a request to it. I really just need to not have it be able to get the response back. And so this is actually a way to say, can I map failures in the large? Because it's easier to inject failures in the large. And can I reduce it to failures in the small? And the reason this is important is because of the realization that if I wanted to generate this schedule, if I wanted to do generation with the granular schedules in QuickCheck, man, it takes a very long time to generate this schedule in QuickCheck because I need to generate these faults in this precise order. And I need four faults to segment one right. And to guarantee a probability of one, I need six faults in a row in the precise asymmetric generation. So we can tweak the way our generators work to try to pathologically find these cases. But one of the problems is that are we smart enough to know all of these cases to be able to encode them in the failure? So anyway, we can use this information to bring stuff back into the model. So I'm running really late here, so let me kind of wrap up. Um, this is the work that we've been doing to make <coughs> distributed actor systems better. Distributed actors basically are a great paradigm. They have so much success in industry. We need to leverage this. Um, but they still haven't solved geodistribution, non-uniform latency, improved performance, failure, failure testing, things like this. And so this is because we made a bunch of assumptions. We made a bunch of assumptions that Erlang, uh, you know, Erickson was very keen to make in 1993, and those assumptions were right. But it's 2018. Distributed Erlang is a lot different thing. Networks are a lot different than they were in 1983, 1993. And so what we presented, what I presented today, is work that's been going on for approximately three or so years, work that's happening with me and Heather at Carnegie Mellon, and it's work on partisan, which is a playground that will allow us to kind of demonstrate useful research ideas moving forward that we hope will contribute to the greater benefits of distributed over. Thank you. Okay, so put your breath and <laughs> ask some questions to I saw Scott furiously writing in the background. He's very nervous. <laughs> no, please, He's like my biggest critic. So the whole point where I, I went for a short introduction is yeah, questions. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, please, 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 please. Well, um, well in, the, in the context of a React-like database, those removal of those reads isn't necessarily innocent. They could be doing read repair. That's true. In the, in, the, in, in the database I built on top of React core, those reads were innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, in the context of, I could not use this model to test React itself. I would have to use a different model to test React itself. Yeah, but just for greater context, that read operations in React are not item potent. Yeah, they will repair the same replicas. Yeah, and stuff like that, yeah. That's correct, yeah. I mean, we were mainly focusing on React Core. And I built a database because I was like, what do I know how to build on React Core? I know how to build a database. What else do I build on React Core? And I was kind of lost. So I was like, all right, I'll just go with the database, right? Well, it, it, it probably makes more sense than building a distributed user instrument like Bash of Android or something. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> Bash of Digital Do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, <clears throat> you talked about that you met with a lot of resistance because people thought that this kind of work had to be done in C, yeah, in, in the VM. That's correct. Itself. But is your performance mm -hmm. the the gains that you've seen? Is that more a function of the improved and smarter algorithms you implemented? So yeah. So I think I think we show both. I think, we show okay. both. I think we show that, so the reason I did the initial comparison of distural to partisan was to show that, uh, was to show that the optimizations wouldn't be hidden by costs we were paying in partisan itself. I was trying to draw the baseline to say, we can be competitive with distural, now let's establish that baseline so we can use the partisan baseline to demonstrate the optimizations one by one. Okay. And so we have a much more, uh, we have a much 
more granular set of uh, experiments to demonstrate those things. Uh, there's a lot of data that we have that I didn't show. Okay. So um, generally speaking, uh, we believe those optimizations will transfer over to um, right. distributed neural Yeah, well, that was going to be my next question is, does it make sense to translate that into C or just leave it as a library? So I think there's two arguments there. So uh, one of the things I didn't mention here was that kind of running concurrently with this work, so actually, uh, um, Stritzinger's company um, is also working on improving this girl. And the reason I know this is because we were in the same European project together uh, as of uh, earlier this year. And so they took a different approach. And so their approach was done with uh, Rickard Green at Ericsson, or Klarna, I forget where he is. But, um, and so the approach that they were doing was they said, let's just arbitrarily fragment messages as small as possible, like 100K. We'll just auto fragment the messages at 100K, and we'll see performance. And so they have a workload that is in a European report that's published in a prototype branch in OTP 23 that shows that uh, they can do this message fragmentation and send the messages, and they do get performance improvements, but their experiments are not done on any workload at all. They just say, like, we believe this optimization works for everything. I believe they're wrong, but um, we'll have to see. We'll have to let the experiments come out. But so what they're doing, so there's, the other bits of work is that our system is extensible. So if you want a new backend, you implement a behavior, and that's it. Uh, we've had users from the community do this. Um, we have a publish subscribe backend I need to talk about here that uses RabbitMQ. So we run distro over RabbitMQ. We did this for another paper uh, at Usenix. And so we've seen cool stuff there. Um, they are trying to provide, so they have a new facility called GenDist or something like this, which is a hook that's exposed. So you can write a driver in Erlang, and then distro will call into that driver and call back out. So they're providing a hook from a foreign function interface from C back into Erlang that allows them to say, you implement management of messaging in Erlang code, and we'll call out to it from the VM. Now, whether that's whether that needs to be that way, whether that's useful, I don't know. Could it be all done in user code if they had better hooks into serialization mechanisms? I believe so. So um, that's an opening. That's a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah. But I, it's. Everybody's moving the same direction. They're just moving in their own ways, I think, and we need that kind of coalesce. Yes? So early on, you showed a graph of uh, the network where you were uh, applying uh, cost to various connections. Yep. And you said there was an external oracle kind That's of right. covering that. Is it uh, is part of it based on the packet flow? Mm -hmm. So that, because I, I was thinking that, you know, if there was a cheap path, it would, if everything always went to the cheap path, huh? then the cheap path would always be. Yeah, so what you want is the oracle, so you assume that there's an oracle. You assume that Oracle provides information to the local machines. The Oracle property is not global. It is like a local uh, local information about uh, what paths are optimal for you. So um, sure, there could be, uh, yes, I imagine there could be a case where there's a path that's low cost for everybody. But since that's local information, that's probably not true in real networks. So that would be a thing that would have to be studied in real networks. Because like, you know, for instance, like if I had a, if I was in a data center and I had a really low cost path, it would probably be like in real data center deployments, it would probably be like, oh, that's like a BGP peer to another network, right? And it probably has the available bandwidth to support people using that common path or something. Whereas uh, in the, if I was doing the optimization within a data center across racks or something like that, uh, everybody, depending on, so you know this thing where you fix the size of Ethernet cables so everybody has the same latency? Like, they don't do that outside of high-frequency trading. And so, really, not everybody's going to have the same cost. Everybody's cost is going to be different in reality. But, unless you're in high-frequency trading where you get paid and enforced by the SEC if it's different. But, so, uh, I think a further study is done. So, what, what we're trying to do is run this experiment in Google Cloud Platform, and that will, uh, that will allow on Kubernetes. Because that will allow us to kind of look at real world data and say, okay, this is what the shape of real world networks look like. Now let's adjust the algorithm. Um, and with HyperView, so Xplot and HyperView are from the same authors in Portugal. We have implementations of them. And at least in those protocols with HyperView, when that was really implemented, the protocol had to be completely changed because they assumed that like they ran it in a simulator. They didn't assume certain failure models. They never used TCP because it was in a simulator. So like under TCP, weird things can happen. Recast, congestion control, flow control, like. All of this stuff can happen in real networks. So their textbook algorithm, 10,000 nodes, in reality was like 2,000 nodes on real networks with real software um, with a bunch of modifications. 
And so with XBOT, we're still in the phase of we've translated the paper, but we haven't run it in a real environment to see what changes are needed to make that work in a real environment. Yes? You mentioned that you rewrote React, React 4 to run on Partisan. I did. And you also did this for Bernie and Q? Uh, I'm in the process of doing okay. it. I started it. So <coughs> what's, like, what's the work effort for? Oh, yeah. So this is one thing we didn't cover in the talk. So in React Core, so React Core, I was able to convert in 290 lines of code. Uh, the majority of those code, the majority of that code was because React had set, so, so two things. So Scott did a really great thing where he introduced this protection against overload, and he centralized all the calls to one module. So that module was really easy to fix. So thanks, Scott. I wouldn't be here without that. <laughs> but uh, less diligent authors of React put send calls all over the place. And so that ran into a situation where I had to like go refocus all the code into a single cut point where I could turn it on and off. So it was 290 lines of code. Now, in terms of, in terms of uh, Vern and Q, I'm swapping out this partisan component, uh, the plum tree component. We've already ported that. So it's really just me swapping these things out. And in terms of the BFT protocol, uh, Andrew Thompson wrote that, and he had all of the call all of the calls were at three points, so that was actually 10, 10 or twelve lines of code. Now, a project I'm working on with Laura Castro, who's on the PC of this, um, is a parse transformation of doing it automatically, and so we have it somewhat working. <laughs> it's really tricky, right? Because like it's really easy to transform a module because you're just rewriting the call names, right? But then, like, if you have higher order functions, like React sends a function over the network, which is always bad. Somebody in here did some research about that. Uh, like, that's really difficult because those calls can't be rewritten when I get a binary compiled closure over the while, right? Um, so, so it doesn't work in those situations. But yeah, we're trying our best. Yes. I was curious. Uh, so, when you have a fully uh, fully connected version, you can say. Okay, I, I know by key or whatever that this thing is over on this node, and so you can go there directly. At the point you break into these other topologies, uh, if they don't have the same view, like each of the steps, like if you're talking through an intermediary, through an intermediary, and then finally to your destination, uh, do you get into cases where you have this this guy assumed that the route was this. This guy assumed that the route was back to here, and you end up in a cycle, or you end up in totally something uh, like an unreachable. That's uh, totally possible. What do you do about? I mean, are there is that, is that part of what you're thinking through, or, or yeah. what, what are your strategies? Then? Um, yeah, so we, I, I can comment on it three ways. The first way, <laughs> I'll <get> my pen. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the first way is um, the first way is yes. If you're using a directory service, you have this problem. Now, Orleans. Orleans runs into this problem all the time because Orleans has actor migration mm -hmm. and it has uh, it allows duplicate activations for a window. And so what that means is that you might be routing where that actor isn't running, but actually that actor is running in two different completely other places. So they run into this situation all the time. Um, and so what they do is they defer their directory out. So they have uh, they defer membership out to an external strongly co consistent service, and then they replicate the registry as much as possible using a DHT. Now, um, this is really difficult to do without stronger forms of consistency. Yeah. So one thing that you could do if you really wanted to avoid the problem completely is that you could synchronize view change memberships with the sends of messages using causal ordering, which guarantees that if you read the view of something and you sent a message to that, you know that the thing either moved or it's still there. Yeah. Now, in the 90s, this problem was solved by people at digital by using forwarding pointers. They did this in a distributed programming language called Emerald. So they basically said, if things are moving around, you have a race condition where the thing is no longer where you just thought it was when you sent the message. And they said, oh, well, you leave a trace of forwarding pointers, and you forward your way back to where the new location is. But then you need garbage collection. So that problem is an idea. That is an ideal deal. Um, and to comment on the last problem around cycles, so cycles are a real deal. Um, when we use this transitive message forwarding, um, what we do is we forward along the tree, so it's a tree, so we know that automatically minimizes the possibilities of cycles, but we do know that there's a possibility that the tree reorganizes very quickly, and it creates a cycle that is constantly turning as the tree is reorganizing. Right. And so to facilitate, facilitate fixing that, we have a maximum pop. 
uh, implemented in the forwarding protocol. So basically, once you receive, once you hit like 36 hops or something, it drops the message. Is this in each of the strategies there? Like, uh, it's only it's in the transitive forwarding mechanism built yeah. on Plumtree. So it basically says like, if the hop count is exceeded, then then the message is dropped on the floor. It's no longer forwarded. Yeah. So along that, that same lines there, um, I know that in your your tests that you put you injected a bunch of failures. But have you done any testing around like high failure rates, like and the network is just constantly changing? So like, we have, yeah, we much, have. How much extra? Yeah, yeah. So this is a funny story. So, so I never intended to do that test. Um, but <laughs> I never intended to do that test. But in the process of running an experiment on Google, so Google is, uh, no, Amazon is crazy expensive. And, and if you want to run 1,500 containers at a sustained amount of time, uh, you use a lot of money. So I, I have famously used 9,800 uh, 9, euros of European taxpayers' money, thank you, Europeans in the room, uh, to run an experiment on Amazon. Uh, that got me two experiments at 30 minutes each. So this shit is crazy expensive, okay? That was with Mesos, Kubernetes is a bit better. So the problem was is that I was like, I need to build these clusters as fast as possible. So when I was comparing performance with Akka, the Akka guy said, yeah, we can scale to 2,000 nodes, but it takes us 52 hours because we have to add a node and wait for full cluster churn and then add another node. And I was like, man, if I have to run 1,500 VMs for 52 hours, like my advisor is gonna kill me. And when I'm standing in front of the European Commission, they're also going to kill me as well. Right, so like, I was like, I gotta do this faster. So I was like, let's join the nodes as fast as possible. So I join the nodes as fast as possible. Well, it turns out the Hyper-V protocol is only tolerant to 80% churn. And even then, it's like the prob it's probabilistic on like 80%, no, it's probabilistic on like 80% churn, it guarantees with like 75%, no, 90% probability, you'll have a, a, a connected component. So what happens when you have like 100% churn, some really, really fast? So it turns out the protocol doesn't convert. Okay. Uh, what happens is that you start out with a cluster, you add a bunch of nodes, and then at the end you have a cluster, you have 1,500 independent clusters of one node. <laughs> because like, everybody's just churned and they've cycled everybody else out, and like somebody knows about half the cluster, another person knows about nobody, because they're just like gaining knowledge and forgetting knowledge really, really fast. And so we had to work around this a lot. And so our protocol, um, so we made a bunch of practical optimizations, which is that if you join and you get churned out really fast because of high churn, you'll rejoin. So the protocol has like, we added a bunch of stuff to the protocol that's practical and not theoretically relevant, <laughs> but that like says like in a real world situation, this churn is going to happen. You should know about your peers. You can learn about peers and reconnect to other peers. So we did a bunch of stuff to deal with this, but for sure, we saw these failure rates. And just to make one other brief comment on that, in terms of reactive failure rates, um, when I first built a fault injector, it was generating these like really bad schedules where it was looking like a lot of faults, and I was like, well, do I model these in the model? Do I not? Like, what happens if I partition like a bunch of nodes from a bunch of other nodes, and then I corrupt every single message in flight? Like, what should the behavior be? Well, I probably shouldn't do anything anymore because that situation shouldn't happen, right? But like, we can make it happen. We have the technology. So, so yeah. So I mean, we've, I've done some stuff that I haven't really done. <laughs> It's more like anecdotal, you know, like bar stories, I guess. But. So, Chris, can you take one more question? One more, yeah. Sure. Any more questions? Why was it done? Last one. Okay. Go on then. Yes. When you have two distributed, so to, say you have in Google Cloud, you have two geographically distributed clusters. Yeah. So, say you're not running them all in one region, you're running them in two regions. What do does, what does the um, network connections look like between the regions? Uh, like, how does the algorithm yeah. resolve? And yeah, 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 yeah. So for, for multi-region stuff, uh, <laughs> so for multi-region stuff, what we've done is we've run it as a single hyper cluster for now. And what we've tried to do is cost optimization. Like, basically, you can think of, like, the cost optimization is kind of like k-means, right? We can kind of figure out exactly where the nodes are because of the latency costs. But what we're trying to do is uh, one research project that I almost had a master's student working on is I want to run two topologies at the same time. I want to basically run full mesh inside the DC, and then I want to do partial mesh across DCs. Or maybe I do full mesh across DCs, and I elect a leader inside the DC, and I have thousands of nodes inside the DC. And so uh, we're still figuring out what's right there. 
And so it's an open question, right? We've tried a bunch of stuff, but we haven't hit on anything that's like, you know, a good paper yet. So, so we're done. Thanks. So that's it. Thank you.